Evidently we missed this. Good evening. Antonio Ortega, I'm the uh, vice chair of the committee. I will be filling in, uh, presiding over this meeting this, this evening uh, in the absence of our chairwoman, Ms. Uh, Ramos Watson. Welcome to the Imperial Irrigation District's Energy Consumers Advisory Committee. Uh, regular meeting of April 4th. Call this meeting to order at 6.03 p.m. Uh, again, uh, April 4th. At this time, I would like to ask the members if we can rise for a Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. <coughs> Mr. Ortega? Here. Mr. Abadi? Mr. Anderson? Butler. <laughs> Mr. McFadden? Mr. Alsup? Mr. Nunez? Here. Mr. Perez? Here. Mr. Zendejas? Here. Ms. Thomas? Ms. Gomez? Here. Mr. Blum? Here. Ms. Franklin? Here. Mr. McNicky? Present. Mr. Avilas? Mr. Ramos? Ms. Ramos Watson? Ms. Broughton? Ms. Soleil? Here. M Mr. Bayard? Here. And Ms. Walker? Thank you. Moving on to item two on our agenda. Uh, please look over your March 7th, 2011 meeting minutes, and if there are any any I changes. Have a correction. Yes. Uh, I have a correction uh, in number six member comments. I had asked if any new programs had been created for small business consumers, not large. And the answer was that the only thing that came close to them were these programs that. Uh, Mr. Koch had uh, already enumerated for us. Oh, this ain't going to work. For me. <coughs> Ms. Gomez? Just a correction of my name. Not the misspelling, <laughs> just the correct name. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, dear. Is that a Where is it? Um, oh, he has call. <laughs> Roll call. First page. First page. Yeah. Members Not present. Either. Second line. Any other modifications or changes? I move approval as amended or change. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Moving on to agenda item number four our oh. integrated resource planning part two and this is a follow-up to last month's meeting dr coke yes uh david coke assistant general manager of energy <coughs> last week we began with an introduction of how the district does its resource planning looking at the various types of legislative regulatory and retail load obligations that we have to meet and one of the things that we presented was our current integrated resource plan. Now, before we get going here too much, um, recognizing that some of the stuff today is going to be fairly technical, I'm going to move right through it so we can get into the exciting issue of d smart meters, which I'm sure people will find much more interesting than this. <laughs> But with, with a load duration curve, we list or show the peak load on our system and then rank our loads from highest to lowest. And then, so on this axis, we just have our peak load. So here we can see that we peaked last year at 1,004 megawatts. Uh, going down, our minimum load for the entire year was about 200 megawatts. But on average, if we look at about 70% of the time, uh, we were above 250 megawatts. <clears throat> so we would look at this and say, we need 250 megawatts. Then here, we'd be looking at, gee, this is an expensive, between about 950, 920, uh, 35, 950 megawatts to 1,000. We're using this amount of energy only for about 80 hours per year. 
So we would prefer not to be buying. We're investing in capital resources, uh, which are very expensive and which will not be used the other 8,300 hours of the year. We would prefer to meet the, this part of our load through our demand side management and conservation activities. Then we're going to buy peaking resources. Peaking resources are used about 10% of the time, where in our case, peaking is anything over about 700 megawatts. So we would have peaking resources that go from 7 to 850 megawatts. Uh, and typically, as you'll see, these tend to be options. These tend to be very inexpensive uh, capacity resources, but have a very high energy price associated with them. Once we have our demand side management, our peaking, and our base load, anything left over is intermediate. Intermediate resources are kind of difficult to deal with. Um, they tend historically to be uh, baseload resources that have become uh, uh, unattractive economically to run. They're only used seasonally in many cases, uh, primarily in the summer months, uh, or purchases that we go out here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so that, we had two dots there for a while, or three dots, I think. So we have our baseload resources, our demand side management, and our peaking. And now we have to choose various types of resources locationally and as required by legislation, appropriate mix between renewable, non-renewable, and then other types of cost considerations that determine what we're going to pick. Now, generally, there's two types of pricing that we look at. A first, a capacity charge. The capacity charge is set forth in the same way we do for commercial customers. It's a cost per kW month. So cost could be $10 a kilowatt month. There's 1,000 kilowatts in one megawatt, so this would cost me $10,000 per megawatt just for the right to call on this energy and then some energy component. The energy component then determines whether or not where the cost that's uh, variable, how much do I pay for fuel and variable O and M. And choosing the right mix between a fixed price and a variable price has a, a very significant impact on our total cost. For example, if we were going to buy something that had a 100% capacity factor, a resource that we were going to use, we would pay uh, $47,200 were an average cost of $63. But if we chose the same pricing structure, the same $10 per kW month and $50 per megawatt hour, but only used at 50% of the time, then our cost would rise all the way to $76.88. That the real um, challenge is making sure that we pay the appropriate amount for capacity and then spread this fixed cost over as many kilowatt hours as we possibly can. That we, we would not want to buy, for example, or use this type of a pricing structure for a resource that we anticipated using <coughs> only for one, may, for one hour during the uh, month, because then it would cost us about $10,000. Yes, when sir? do you buy the green energy? Uh, when do we buy it? Mm -hmm. uh, at, the, well, at the peak or at the or over there at the base or where? Um, right now, everything that we've bought on green energy is strictly a uh, energy cost. That in effect, what we're doing is paying only when the unit is producing. Sixty. Okay, so we're protecting ourselves and our ratepayers. Mm -hmm. uh, the Green Hunter Mesquite is $102 per megawatt hour uh, with some escalation. The Sun Peak Solar starts at, I believe, $106 per megawatt hour with some escalation. Uh, so the green resources, uh, a Yuma County water uh, purchase is $70 per megawatt hour. So each of those we only pay because they're relatively low capacity factor resources. We want to push all the cost into the variable side and have as little fixed cost as we can. Now, if you're looking at a geothermal plant, for example, 
or uh, as Ms. Saleya and I were talking beforehand, a nuclear plant, these costs get dominated by their very high capital costs. So a geothermal plant uh, costs about $5,000 a um, KW or $5 million a megawatt to build, $250 million a pl uh, plant. But the energy from this resource is essentially free, except for some variable O&M cost. A nuclear plant costs about $8 million a megawatt to build, but the energy is, again, very inexpensive. So if you were selling those plants, you'd want to make sure that you covered your capital cost with a fixed cost that you're going to get regardless, and then a variable cost that covers your uh, energy component. Did that answer your question, sir? Yeah. Okay. So we try to make sure that we're mixing the right a uh, combination of fixed and variable cost in order to minimize our total cost of energy. Okay, not just the cost from that particular resource, but because all resources interplay with each other, we have to model each one of our resources and the impact that it plays on our overall cost structure. Uh, generally, and this again generally, the peaking and intermediate resources uh, have high cap uh, capacity prices. Um, you may see a 10 or 12, 14 dollars a KW month because you're essentially reserving the right to that unit whenever you feel like it. Baseload resources must take resources, um, tend to have low capacity prices, and energy costs tend to dominate. Okay, so uh, looking at that, we can decide what type of resource we're looking at, what type of pricing we're going to do, and then we can really mix it up. Okay, the type of resources that were the types of alternatives that we use, the must take for the base load, uh, must take during peak or off peak periods, the seasonal purchases, take or pay, where we uh, take the energy or pay if we don't, and take and pay, where we pay only if we take the energy. Okay, so these are the type of alternatives uh, for physical energy, <coughs> but then we play with a lot of options. Okay, the, the district is, uh, uh, uses quite a bit of different uh, options when we come to purchasing our capacity and energy needs. And options make financial sense when we don't know what our demand is. An example of this, I understand it was hot here this weekend, I was up in Rancho Mirage, uh, but our peak went from on um, Friday was 450 megawatts. The next day it had jumped up on Saturday to, um, I'm sorry, on Thursday it was 450 megawatts. On Friday it had jumped up to 570 megawatts. So we saw roughly 120 megawatt increase in demand uh, just over one day. Now, the option gives us the right, uh, but not an obligation, to exercise a purchase at some predetermined price. Okay? Now, the first type of option that we have is just a simple call option. Okay? And a call option, and I use gas here, just uh, it was a little bit simpler in putting this together. We just pay for the right to buy at a certain price. So in this case, we have bought the right to purchase gas or electricity, and there's just a conversion factor from this to energy prices, uh, at $4. If the price is below $4, we don't exercise the option. If the price is above $4, we exercise and pay at that price. So the price were to jump up as uh, when I put this together, the price was $4. But since the um, <clears throat> uh, Japanese earthquake and the um, Libyan action, we've seen energy, uh, gas prices jump up about 50 cents. So in this case, we can exercise the option of $4 and get the gas back for at, uh, or purchase it at $4 even though the market price is $4.50. Why would somebody do this for us? Because we're paying them to take the risk. An option like this would cost us about $300,000 a month where the price of the option depends upon how long we have the right to that uh, gas or energy. Uh, the price relative to current market conditions. If I had bought it, if current market was $4 and I exercise, uh, bought the option at $6, it may only cost me $75,000. Uh, if I went up to $8, then it may cost me $20,000, recognizing it wouldn't be covered very much. And we use these quite a bit, particularly for our summer peak. 
Um, do we know what our summer peak is going to be this summer? No, the forecast is about 1,000 megawatts. But we have to cover ourselves to 1,150 megawatts with reserves. So we have about 100 megawatts of options, 125 megawatts of options in there that guarantee that we can get the energy should we need it to meet our load. But we're trying to minimize the cost to our customer by hopefully never having to call this option. Hey, has everybody totally lost at this point? I'm not. Good. Uh, I, uh, so when we're buying compressed natural gas in large, in large quantities, is we're, we're basically paying for the storage, the, the fuel farm or the, the gas storage farm? Storage facilities, yes. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the gas itself. If we are buying compressed gas, generally when we buy it, we buy it at border. Okay. And we don't own any storage. We let the marketers Marketer take that buy, particular okay. risk. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're paying for the storage. with. Yes, they are. Okay. Question. Um, David, how far out do you buy your options? Uh, out to 36 months. Oh, you can. So you are, is that classified as a leap when you're doing 36 months? As a... Leap? Or are you just buying a 36 month out? Oh, no, I'm, I'm not buying a strip. Okay, I'm buying individual months going out to 36 months. I'm sorry, I didn't. Okay. Um, but we do, under our risk management policy, which governs how far we go out, the district's power supply budget must have certain uh, volatility or meet certain volatility requirements so that we cannot put ourselves at risk of a 25 or 30 or 40 or 50 percent increase in budget so many years down the road. Uh, <clears throat> for us, we always manage our budget so that we have no more a value at risk of our of no more than 10 percent in the current year. So if our budget this year is 230 million dollars, I should not see the power costs even if the market turns against me. Something horrible happens in the Mideast, prices go zooming up, um, all the nukes are shut down here in the United States and we start buying gas. My price should not exceed $260 million. Okay, so we have that. Two years out, it's 20%. Okay, so we give ourselves the fact that we, we tend to have a forward pricing, uh, upward sloping price curve. So I can buy out 10 years. Unfortunately, today gas is about $4. 10 years from now, gas is about $20. I don't know what it is exactly. It's mm -hmm. I could lock it in. I could give you price certainty, but I could give you price certainty at a cost you couldn't afford. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, are you <clears throat> are those pro are there programs built in that you're using to do your your forecasting and your? Mm -hmm. We we have a. You know, I've said before we have probably the best economic forecasting group in the valley uh, at IID. Uh, we're used to doing long-term economic forecasts. Uh, we also have uh, some very sophisticated modeling techniques that we use both for hourly models. We use a particular model called ProMod, which is a, uh, I can throw out the words for you, a stochastic Monte Carlo simulation, hourly simulation model, where we put in all our resources and then it just cranks through a few hundred thousand times and gives me a 20-year forecast by hour, which tends to be very... Um, uh, they're not hard to do. You're just manip manipulating so much data. If you're doing 100 simulations <clears throat> per year for 20 variables, that's 20 variables times 100, or 20,000 times 8,760, which is 16 million variables per year for 20 years. So you're working with 32 million variables. It's just hard to keep the d data in the right place, but we do it. Um, Thank you. <laughs> okay. This is the simplest. The next is what we call a collar. Uh, we tend to use a lot of costless collars uh, where you have some price, and then we purchase the uh, right to buy uh, at a cap and sell a floor. Okay, These generally are not um, symmetric. 
prices don't generally be if you're buying at four dollars, four fifty is not going to be the um, upward. If you buy a fifty percent protection upward and sell the fifty uh, the protection downward, you don't usually get as much downward protection uh, in this. But it guarantees that your price will stay within this range. So if the price goes above, in this case, four dollars and fifty cents, we would pay four dollars and fifty regardless of what it went up to. And if it went down to a dollar fifty, we would still pay three fifty regardless of what it went down to. The nice thing about these is the there's no premium associated with it. We sell off the uh, upward or uh, downward uh, price <coughs> protection in exchange for upward price protection. Okay, so we and the marketer just come to an agreement on this. Very easy to do, uh, but the nice advantage of them is they're inexpensive. They're cheap, free. Uh, and then we have just the fix for floating uh, swap uh, here, and we're getting ready to do this uh, for the Yucca po uh, power plant where this in the next couple of weeks, we actually complete the pipeline this week, but we're waiting for U.S. Customs to come out and allow us to turn it on, and we can't do that until Customs comes through and does it. Uh, so it looks like it'll be another two weeks before they do that. Here, we'll just agree to some price uh, for gas delivered at the Yucca plant. If the price is below that, then we're going to pay the marketer, whatever the daily price is, plus some premium. If the price is above this, then we'll just pay this, and then the marketer will give us the difference here. And then we throw up at the end of the month. Okay, the marketer in this case is doing just the opposite. He's floating for fixed swaps. Okay, so this is also very commonly used in the uh, California ISO right now where people just move back and forth, the CFD. But this is our biggest, uh, uh, will, be, will be our biggest particular type of uh, uh, activity as soon as we get the Yucca plant up and operating. I think that's as far as I wanted to go today. Uh, I can show you next time which of the different contracts we have meet these. But what I did want to show is that we are using a very sophisticated modeling techniques with very sophisticated um, financial and physical activities that have uh, helped keep our power supply costs relatively low. How low? Uh, three years ago, we were looking at $280 million. Today, we're looking, for the last two years, we're $208 million. Uh, even with a very substantial change for disruption, uh, we expect to keep power supply costs relative in the same ballpark uh, for the next two and a half years. And we keep putting in further and further out. I would like to go to 60 months and have recommended that uh, but right now, we're just not quite set up for that. So, any, yes, sir. Mr. Cloak, I think uh, in the last meeting sometime back, you mentioned about establishing a task force, energy task force. And what was the uh, purpose and urgency of that task force? <clears throat> I don't, we, we have set up, I don't remember bringing it up in the board. Somebody We're did. in here. There has been a um, task force set up between the board, the, uh, the board of directors, the board of supervisors. Um, Lupe is on it. Um, the head of the water council, uh, water, council, uh, water uh, advisory committee. Uh, to deal with the transmission issues that we're looking at uh, currently. Okay, so the, there we have an internal policy board dealing with what we call resource adequacy, dealing with how we deal with other, util mm -hmm. other utilities and balancing authorities outside IID. Oh, I see. Then we have one that's going to be set up, made up of the generators within the valley who wish to sell their power outside the district. Um, and obviously they would be interacting with us to make sure that we design and construct the transmission facilities they need to get their power out. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions for Dr. Kolk <coughs> from any of the committee members? None. Thank you, Dr. Kolk. 
At this time, I inadvertently skipped um, agenda item number three, which is the public comment period. So I would like to uh, ask any members of the audience who would like to address this body uh, to please step forward at this time. Um, we do have, uh, we will open comment, public comment period. Seeing no movement, then uh, we will close the public comment period and uh, move on to our next item, which is uh, the advanced metering infrastructure update. Mario Escalera. Mario, yes. did you notify the people that were over in, in Yuma, I mean, uh, in La Quinta, that we were going to be discussing this issue today? It's in the agenda. Uh, no, but I mean, did you make any contact with them at all? Remember, they gave us some information. They, they provided some information. They want to make a presentation. And I wasn't at the last DCA meeting, oh, Gil. Well, there were some people there. Uh, I think there was three of them. And they gave us some information regarding this particular issue. Apparently, the, uh, it has some effect on some people that have... Um, radiation. Um, pacemakers. It's a health it? issue. Pacemakers, pacemakers and other units and s install on them. And they wanted to address, but we never gave them a chance. Uh, other than to tell you, Gail, that it's it's in it's been in the it was agendized uh, with everything else, and it's in part of the website. You know, I'll I'll, I'll get the names and I'll contact them. I know that there was well, um, lady. Marion should have the name. Do you have the name, Marion? Does anybody have the? I do. The I have it. Okay. I'll give it to you. Okay. Um, the. Uh, what we wanted to do is today is because there is some renewed interest uh, in the, the uh, what is referred to in the industry as smart meters. We wanted to bring this forward to the ECAC meeting uh, and uh, and just give you a quick update where the district is in its meter replacement uh, program. Uh, I must emphasize that really our program is basically a meter replacement program and yet because it coincides with a lot of the new requirements set by both federal and state uh, then became an AMI a meter replacement. Uh, so with that I've also asked uh, Mr. Tom King who is heading our team for meter replacement AMI to bring forward a, this presentation. He's probably the most apropos person to do that. We've also brought some key staff uh, personnel to ask some of the, uh, if you have any more direct questions to ask. So with that, I'd like to ask Tom to come up and uh, do the presentation. Thank you, Mario. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> I've got a few things I want to hand around, and, and I apologize, I'm going to stick you with starting it. You don't have to get up and pass it around. Mm -hmm. The first item here is the conventional electromechanical meter that many of you may or may still have on your house. If not, you'll see it tonight. They have these handy dandy little clocks. Some people look at them as clocks and uh, little discs, and they're turned by little gears in the back. That's why it's called electromechanical, because the disc, the big disc out here, turns at a, at a rate comparable to the amount of amperage that's flowing through the meter. So the more power you use, the faster that little disc spins. That's the old technology. Is there any room in there? As you're passing it around, be careful, it is a little heavy. The next technology is going to an electronic meter. They would look like this. Of course, this one powers off so you can't see the display. And if you take this cover off, it looks like this inside. You can see it's a, not much in the way of moving parts, mostly all electronic. So while I'm talking, you can look at the toys and maybe you won't be quite as bored. <laughs> as was said earlier, I'm Tom King. I'm here to present you with an update on our district's uh, AMI project. Next slide. First off, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the advanced uh, metering efforts that started with legislation. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the district studies that we've done, both internal and with our uh, consultants and the past conclusions of some of those. Uh, then our plan for replacing the electromechanical meters. That's what we're kind of concentrating on now. And then I'll talk about some of the operational efficiencies and issues. Okay. 
If you were here uh, about a year ago, we had Mike Bell, one of our consultants, uh, give a report of our meter committee. And a lot of it started in, in uh, 2005 with the passage of the Energy Policy Act of 2005. That was uh, warranted a study and report on the national benefits of demand response and trying to get customers to conserve energy by tying it to a time of the use and uh, to try to encourage uh, people to conserve more. It required us to offer net metering to customers, so those of you that might have solar panels, that was when you got your net meter. It also extended daylight savings time. So those of you that like daylight savings time, you can be thankful that started in 2005. The concept was to help reduce the need for additional generation by putting some controls on the customer's ends that would allow and encourage them to conserve electricity. In 2007, they started, the uh, federal government passed the Energy Independence and Security Act, and that added onto it, which was an attempt to modernize the electric transmission system, encourage utilities to employ what they at that time defined as smart grid technology. So that was the kickoff in 2007. The concept at that time was also that U.S. electric utilities should obtain 15% of their power from renewable sources by 2020, which that's the federal, of course our state went beyond that. That's also when they imposed the condition of having our light bulbs be 25% more efficient, and that's why we're looking at phasing out the incandescent bulbs. State of California in 2010 uh, passed California Senate Bill number 17, and that's the state's policy on modernizing the grid. And they want to maintain electrical and secure service with an infrastructure that can meet future growth in demand while achieving other objectives such as integrating distributed generation, uh, demand side resources, and what they called smart technologies. So the state of California is pushing that as well. And it requires us to file a plan by July 2011. Those are the major three laws that are affected. Next. So we've had multiple studies on the technology that we should move towards in the future. In 2005, we initiated three pilot programs in response to the Energy Policy Act of 2005. We went with cellular uh, commercial meeting, metering to determine uh, our characteristics, load characteristics. We also tried radio technology, which is the ITRON, what's called ERT, and that stands for encoder, receiver, transmitter. It's a module installed within the electric meter. That electronic meter that's coming around is not an ERT meter, but it, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And we also tested the uh, Calera power line carrier system where the signal is sent through the power lines in what they call a TWAX, a two-way automatic communication system. Those two were uh, done in 2006. So we tested those technologies for residential single phase metering, and in 2008, we hired GAC Consulting to compare those different technologies and make a recommendation. Based on that, we standardized on the ERT uh, meter technology. In 2009, districts hired the Matrix Consulting Group, and they worked with in-house staff and recommended the district evaluate replacing the existing electromechanical meters with electronic AMR meters. In 2009, we established a meter committee, uh, which uh, consultant Mike Bell was a part of, and they recommended that the district develop a plan to replace the electromechanical meters with meters can, could be utilized as part of a future AMI system, since there is the possibility of legislation forcing us to move in that direction. And certainly the state of California is encouraging the investor-owned utilities to move in that direction, and the thought was that will probably be the state of the art that we'll have to migrate towards. First, we decided we needed to replace the electromechanical meters uh, because their standard for losses on electromechanical meter is plus or minus 2% as established by the state CUP. So that means you could be off as much as 2% on, a, on anybody's bill and the meter would still be deemed as accurate. 
Digital meters, however, have a much higher standard, and there it's plus or minus 0.5%. So it was felt that if we replaced our electromechanical meters, there would be some potential savings to us or the customers, because the meter could be reading heavy as well as light. And we felt that that would be the fairest all to get rid of those older meters first. And about a year ago, Mike Bell presented the results of that committee's, and basically what they recommended at that time was that we migrate towards an AMI meter, but use it in an AMR mode, automatic meter reading, not, not, not uh, the other term. AMI actually stands for uh, advanced meter infrastructure. So quite a bit difference. But they recommended we use the AMI type meter in an AMR mode and that we'd have about a payback of seven and a half years. And that was a presentation you should have heard about a year ago. Don't know if you remember it. So, okay, that brings us up to the next slide. This shows our service territory. And I realize the, the dates uh, over in the right up-hand corner are kind of hard to read. But basically, you see a lot of blue dots. Those show the age of the meters. We have a roughly 98,000... <laughs> Uh, non-ERT meters that are out there. And the vast majority of those meters were installed in the 1980s and 1990s. We have approximately uh, ERT meters, we have about 41,000 of those. So those blue dots are the things that we want to change out. There are some very old meters, which is, looks like a red dot, and I don't know if you can see one. I think there's one small red dot in El Centro, and there might be a, a yellow dot up in the La Quinta area showing some of the older meters that are up there. Vast majority, though, were installed in the 1980s and 1990s. Next slide. The uh, meter committee recommended that we go to a three to five year replacement plan of the existing meters. It was felt it was a little bit too difficult to try to uh, do it all in one year. Plus, we're not real excited about changing meters in the middle of summer because if you start yanking meters and, and turn customers off, their air conditioner might not go back on. So we're trying to figure a way to have the work done during the off seasons. Use of the earth meter, uh, it, it's, it's a good technology. It's only one way. We can't uh, turn on people's uh, pool pumps or off people the pumps, but uh, we can certainly read the meter. And so we felt continuing the use of the ERT meter was warranted. And it was believed that we should start the meter exchange sometime in the fall of 2011. Now, we're going to consider the two-way communications after all the meters are replaced within a defined area. This means that if it's cost-effective to go to an AMI, we'll certainly do so. But right now, what we're getting prepared to do is go out with an RFP to get pricing to see just if, how cost-effective it was going to be. All the studies prior to this were done with cost estimates that were basically based upon what the consultant knew or based upon what they thought would occur. Now by going out for a request for a proposal, we actually can get exact numbers from the vendors, the suppliers and the meters, okay? Um, yes? Um, the RFP, is that gonna be for installation of the meters or the purchase of the meters? That would be for developing the type of scheme that we would need to have in order to implement an AMI and basically to replace the meters. We would end up with a different RFP if we decide to go with outside labor. Okay. okay. So we're gonna do it in, in house now? Mm, I don't know. Oh, I, I, it, it really depends on what, what route we end up going down. If we, if we, for instance, stay with our present supplier of the meter that we have, we could go into it more gradually because our own people would be able to change a lot of those meters out. If we go to a totally different technology, however, we don't want to have to hire a bunch of meter readers because now we've replaced meters and we have no way of reading them. And the, the, the sample you showed us of, of the, the smart meter, that's been in, in operation already? It's yes. Tested. Actually, that one's defective. Oh. That's why I didn't care if you dropped it. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow, Along with the test, and now you've answered the question. Uh, <laughs> no, so, you know, everything, uh, electromechanical meters fail, and, and certainly so will a digital solid state devices. And in this case, it could have been any number of things lightning shot, it could have been, you know, voltage problem. Yes? Um, <clears throat> I have a question uh, regarding the uh, validity. You said it was 0.05. Uh, how, how do you confirm, verify that? There's testing that they perform on each and every meter. As part of our RFP process, we're going to require them to do certified testing. 
Uh, they have machinery that does that. Periodically, they just go. No, no. Right this in. is when we first purchase it. Okay. The the periodic testing thereafter would be up to us to have our personnel go out and test the meter. I see. And and there's a means to do that. Yes. You well, there's two ways of doing it. Normally, you can bring it back into the shop and test it, or they actually have some portable equipment that you can take out to the customer's uh, residence and test it. Oh, so you have to uh, remove the existing meter and then work on it. It's not just a plug in verify you can take the portable and go out and do the plug-in there for the customer if they want to witness it but that involves turning up they have to pull the meter to do today that. yes now if and when we get say our ami process up and working there may be things that we could do through the radio but we're not there yet okay. is is there a law requiring you to verify it on a periodic basis or an annual basis or well we're not subject to cpuc rules that pertain to that but we do have a desire to have accurate metering and we have had a policy to go out and periodically test them those especially that that are requested by the customer will go out and handle them though we do may have some meters out there that are 20 years old that haven't been tested but typically those type of meters uh, have a good operating range and haven't been a problem when we pull the meter off for instance to retire it it'll be tested just to see and we have not had that many that have been way out of variance. <clears throat> and what do you do if they are out of variance? Well, then we'll have to address that if it's, you know, if it's a problem where the customer hasn't been paying enough, uh, that's what Bob Fugit does in the back of the room there. He goes and he visits <laughs> that customer and says, what kind of deal can we work out? And if it's uh, that we owe, that we've been overcharging, of course, we try to figure out what that would be and we pay them. Will the reading of these meters uh, impact people that have those uh, devices on their bodies? Well, I, I don't believe it will. I think that's still a, an article that a lot of folks are arguing about and a lot of uh, high paid talent is studying. The meters themselves will harm you less than a cell phone. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a pacemaker and you have a cell phone, you're probably in worse shape than if you have a meter on your house. Mm -hmm. Now. The other thing with the meter on the house is most of the radio frequency is going to be tr projecting out from the house, not into the house, because of the design of the meter. And so the further away you get, it drops off dramatically to where, you know, you probably have more, more problems, again, with your laptop computer, uh, with the radio waves you're coming that are hitting you with that then you're going to have with a meter or if you go to one of these starbucks coffee shops where they have a you know some kind of a web server site sitting there you're going to be bombarded with that the other issue on the meters is it's generally not on all the time when they transmit when for instance we go down and we collect the, the signal the whole idea is that it'll, it'll transmit a packet of information in about a second now, and then it goes dead? Then, yeah, it shuts off again until someone comes back and collects it again. Now, when we go to a AMI system where you might have a, what they call a mesh network where the meters all communicate with each other, uh, then it may have a little longer duration, but my understanding is that the wattage is less. Mm -hmm. Will it impact the computers? No. No? No. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Here's what we're looking at. Our uh, immediate benefits to replacing the electromechanical meters. First is the meter accuracy. We already talked about that. Uh, we'll have a reduction in misreads. When you automate the process, it's not likely that the meter reader is going to misinterpret and twist numbers around, okay? Or that they can't read the meter. They'll pick it up regardless if the gate's locked or the dog's out there, okay? Because they're picking it up through the air. Less susceptible to tampering. In the old electromechanical meter, you could turn it upside down, and the meter would run backwards. Okay. The new meters, you can turn it upside down, and we'll still collect money. Thank you. <laughs> well, we didn't tell you that. Is that a fact? For, for point, yeah. <laughs> now that we're getting rid of them, I'm telling them. To do <laughs> we can improve our work efficiency by eliminating dealing with the locked gates, angry dogs, or upset customers, and, and that helps save uh, safety for our employees. We can read more meters within the same time period. No need to physically pull the meter to disconnect the customers. Under the, one of the, uh, we're talking about some positive uh, events for the efficiencies of operations. The newest meter that we're looking at will have a switch in it 
200 amp rated switch. So if you have a 200 amp uh, main on your house, you'd have a 200 amp switch in the meter. And we could actually electronically open that and we wouldn't have to even be there to, to uh, pull the meter. Now we have to pull the meter out. They put little rubber boots on those lugs on the meter and then slam it back in. That's, and it's a, so it's a manual process, but under the, with the new meter technology that's out there, you could actually open that switch up and you don't have to be right there, which is good for a couple of reasons. I think for employee safety, it's good because very often the people that are being disconnected don't want to be disconnected and they're angry about it. And so that helps. And in other cases, if we have a tight schedule, we can't always get to everybody. So if we want to put them back in service, it, it becomes a problem. We can't get it scheduled quick enough. Or if you go to electronic uh, switchability, that really helps. Do you use a power line carrier? No, that would be, that's a radio. Okay. Okay, that's a radio. All right, improvement in customer service. I already mentioned less meter errors, can read meters from a distance. We don't have to be right in front of the house to read the meter. We can be down the street perhaps, or if we put in a full AMI system someday, we could actually do it from the office. Future benefits, of course, would be the different rate options that we have. Uh, we don't have them today, but we might have them someday in the future if people start driving more electric cars. We're not gonna want them to plug it in uh, in the middle of the afternoon during the peak. But certainly at the night hours or the shoulder hours, we probably would like to have that. And maybe we could offer a rate for that. <clears throat> There's also a time of use rate, which the district has not pushed, but other utilities do have, that we could offer to our customers if we wanted to go that way. These meters would allow that type of thing. Okay, so there's a number of different options. Interruptions, you know, if you want to have uh, the district have the right to turn off your pool pump during the peak as part of that DSM program that was talked about earlier, that would be another feature that that meter would allow you to do. All right. Uh, meters uh, issues, metering. Well, one of the issues is that the meter's not cheap. AMI meters tend to run about $100 more than a, than a standard meter. How many manufacturers are there? Meters? Well, there's four different manufacturers, but they don't build compatible projects. Okay, so now our, our present electromechanical meter has four lugs. Yes. So, but they all make a four lug meter. They all make four lug meter, but if you if you want to implement AMI, you've got to you've got to use their technology. Oh. You wouldn't want to mix them because then you'd have to buy four different software packages. It'd be like having an Apple computer and an IBM computer. They don't really going to talk to each other. Now, the bigger utilities around us, the investor-owned, they have put the condition on whoever gets their successful bid, and they're about a year, a half, maybe to two years ahead of us. Uh, they said that there has to be a second provider of that meter. So the technology then is sold to another provider, and they buy a certain amount of meters from them. And that's kind of what we're looking for, too, if we go to an RFP. Okay, so we're talking about what, Siemens, and I know Schlumberger. Yeah, there's GE, there's uh, Elster, Itron. Okay. okay. Yeah, quite a few. The older meters, there was even more, but newer technology has dwindled. There's, there's a, little, a little fewer. Okay. Operational efficiencies, I already talked a little bit about maybe the ease of reading the meter, the ease of, of doing disconnects if you needed to do a disconnect. Uh, the fact that there will be fewer can, uh, bills that are going to be wrong because of the wrong red. So there's some issues there. Uh, customer privacy issues. If you've done only uh, newspaper reading, you've probably heard about people screaming that you're going to know when I'm home because you can look and find out what my meter or my energy usage is, and then you're going to do something with that. Either rob me because I'm not home, or you're going to sell it to somebody else who's going to come in and try to sell me products. And so the courts of I don't know if the courts have weighed in at it, but the legislature I think has, and they're kind of looking at that. That'll be the property of the customer. It'll be held in trust by the utility, but the utility won't be able to sell it. Uh, impact of radio frequency waves, we talked a little bit about that earlier. I'm not an expert in that area. Of course, the, all these meters, the newer ones, comply with FCC. The FCC is related to tissue, heating up the tissues and causing damage that way. There's the other issue that, well, okay, maybe it's not going to heat up the tissue, but it's still going to cause long-term cancer because I'm exposed to it for the next 20-some years. I, no one knows. You know, they haven't got a study that's gone for 20 years on this technology. 
But they do know that people have been using cell phones. I myself have had one for probably 15 years, and I stick it to my ear all the time, and this is about 10 times less than that. Now, I'm not on it all the time, of course, but neither are you standing in front of your meter of your house all the time. How, how do you know that? How do you know that it's 10 times less? Oh, they've taken measurements. Who's they? The number of outfits have taken measurements. The one that's quoted the most is Richard Tell and Associates. They're saying that a smart meter device at 10 feet is, this is in microwatts, so it's pretty small, I'm not gonna toast any bread with it. Microwatts per square centimeter is 0.1 for a smart meter. But if you had a laptop computer, it's between 10 and 20. So, you know, how often do we have our kids sitting in front of the computer or the television? If you hold a cell phone up to your head, it's between 30 and 10,000 right here. I figured the 10,000 was my mother-in-law. <laughs> if you stand like I do impatiently in front of the microwave, uh, you're getting 5,000. So 5,000 versus 0.1. Is your mother-in-law here tonight? No. <laughs> I wouldn't say it if she was. <laughs> Okay, the other uh, issue, of course, is we're always concerned about uh, future changing federal and state standards. And that is, you know, they've implemented these other laws saying that they want us to move in that direction. Well, what if we move in that direction and then they either change direction, like they're kind of doing with the PG&E up on the north end where they're saying, well, now you've got to come up with a meter that it's not wireless. And so what's the cost to do that? And so in our RFP, we have put some language that has asked the providers to give us that option. And we'll see what that result is, but we're not there today. Okay, any other questions? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Moving on to our next item on the agenda, uh, Marion with the ECAC attendance report. <coughs> I just have a very short report today. Uh, we have we got confirmation from the County of Riverside. Becky Broughton has been reappointed from the county. Mm -hmm. uh, she will go for board ratification on tomorrow's um, IED Board of Directors agenda, and hopefully we'll have that seat all buttoned up. Once that's done, we'll have all 20 seats completed and filled. Uh, there is one other update I want to share with the committee. Uh, they are progressing still on the video conferencing. Uh, they were testing, I believe, this week. Hopefully they'll be able to do a demo with the IID Board of Directors in the next couple weeks. And then once they've finished with that demo, we'll be able to uh, start using that with the ECAC. Thanks. Does that mean <laughs> we can expect not to commute anymore? We, what we'll do is we'll. I guess my question should, is: this. Do you have the option? Will we? Yeah. Will it be in operation by next month's meeting? Hopefully, yes. I can't guarantee it, but I can hope. I can hope. I, I can't guarantee anything. Mm -hmm. uh, what I foresee happening is that we will have the meeting locations in both places, and you will be free to either drive or to stay at the local meeting, whichever you choose. Do you think it'll happen next month? I'm fairly confident, but I, I can't guarantee it. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for that report. And the next item, a department update from uh, Dr. Koch. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I have two, two minor things, were small things that are very important. The first, we're going to have uh, two weeks from last Saturday, our uh, Earth Day celebration. Uh, you all have invitations there in front of you. Historically, the district has not done a particularly good job of uh, uh, pushing its Earth Day, uh, I'll say, obligations or um, responsibilities. Uh, what we're going to be showing here includes demonstrations of various types of conservation activities, along with a number of uh, other activities uh, aimed at children. Hopefully this will grow into something bigger as uh, some of the other utilities I've been with over the years. This will be at Imperial Valley College and hopefully all of you will come. The second is, as I've said earlier, we're waiting for our Yucca uh, gas pipeline to be um, 
approved by the U.S. Customs, this is going to result in a very significant and immediate reduction in our power supply cost, as for the first time, we don't have to rely on outside utilities to purchase our gas for us and pay whatever the price happens to be. I'm going to bite. Why does Customs have to approve? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, everybody's asking, I'll bite. I, I wish I had a map with you, but the pipeline itself goes from Ehrenberg, which is in the northwest uh, corner of uh, Arizona, comes down through western California into Mexico. Okay. Uh, it, what the Is that an builders, no, it's Trans uh, Canada. Th this pipeline was definitely the most difficult negotiations I've ever participated in with three different countries, five different, uh, three, uh, three different states, five different suppliers, um, and a multitude of other problems. And we got all the way to the end. Uh, and well, we finally did get a Mexican customs and a U.S. customs uh, uh, broker, uh, getting them to approve it was has been extremely difficult, extremely difficult. Miss Crillo is back there in the background, uh, has been dealing with them probably straight for the last five weeks. I, um, Go through a custom broker? Yes, oh my God. but this all was due to the fact that the Kayshan Indians would not allow us to cut across uh, Kayshan oh. land. Oh. Okay. 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 So instead, can we charge them more for the energy? Uh, I don't believe so, ma'am. Okay. But I, I doubt seriously that they really understood that we were one of the people, nor do I think they really cared. But the net result is we had to swing down about three miles south of the border. So we're dealing with U.S. and Mexican import-export laws and U.S. customs and Mexican custom laws. And that has been as challenging as trying to uh, get the permit to drill under the Colorado River and build the pipeline. You could write a book. Right. Uh, <laughs> she can't. I, I have, I trust what she tells me about the customs people. I do not meet with customs people <laughs> um, because I have no clue what I'm talking about. But when it goes into effect, we will see an immediate uh, roughly $8,000 per day reduction in our natural gas costs. Wow. Uh, it is. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. Are there, Are there any, are we required to pay any tariffs of any sort then if we're doing import? Uh, we're, we're not to Mexico or to the United States, but we do have very solid reporting obligations. We do pay tra uh, pipeline tariffs, but not like trade tariff, as okay. you're talking about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So none of this is, this is coming from the north or the back east? Um, it interconnects, Ehrenberg is, there are two natural gas pipelines that feed Southern California, uh, uh, Transamerican and El Paso. This interconnects with the El Paso pipeline. So the gas would be coming into, uh, from the Permian Basin from West Texas oh. up okay. into Arizona. We would take it and purchase it there. Then it goes around uh interconnects with what's called the Baja Norte line, which is uh, south of the border where the new uh, liquefied natural gas facility has been constructed. And then we just take it off at uh, El Gadonis, uh, a little lateral that goes over to the ECA facility. Are we, we going to get any liquefied uh, gas from Mexico? <laughs> Not by choice. Realistically, yes, we will. Okay, but we don't physically... Financially, no, we won't. Oh. Okay, but it is a big thing for us. And as soon as we can turn it on, the plant, it is done. It is ready to be turned on. Mm -hmm. APS is, has turned theirs on. Arizona. We're waiting for customs. <laughs> so those are the two things. Yes, sir. Um, there's quite a bit written on the, in the newspaper regarding the ECA. Uh, regarding the the floating rate, floating, uh, what's can you give us a little update of what's going on? Uh, I believe it goes to the board 
uh, on April 12th, and the board will may or may not, whatever the board's pleasure is, choose to either float the rate, not float the rate, or to look at restructuring the floating rate. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's two or three options that will be presented to it. What the board's pleasure is, I don't know. Well, because uh, according to the newspaper, I'm just <clears throat> remembering what they said, uh, the acting general manager is proposing that we let the ECA rate float. Now, well, by, def def by definition, an energy cost adjustment is supposed to float. Yeah. Yeah, so my question is, are they going to let it float? <laughs> it, it, the floating ECA is currently fixed. Yeah. The recommendation from the finance department is going to be let it float. Which way the board decides or which alternative that's being presented to the board that they ultimately decide to use is going to be up to them. Okay. But I think we're, I think, I don't want to speak for the board. I believe that the direction of the board to staff is make a floating ECA work again. Okay. How the board decides to make that work is up to the board. Yeah. And then the other thing is that um, they also talked about the stabilization uh, amount that is being set aside for stabilizing the rates in case it does float and it goes way out. How much, how much money is in there? Uh, at this time, it's $53 million and change, and I believe it's part of the recommendation it will go up to $100 million. I thought it was a hundred and some odd million dollars that was in there already. Not until this, until the board adopts the transfer, which I believe will be part of it was presented to the board last week to add another $47 million. Currently, uh, under the board's direction, it's restricted to $100 million. We can bring it up to 100 with a recommendation that it goes to $150 million. By the way, one of the reasons that we have this is because of the um, way in which we do the power purchasing that you saw earlier in the morning with all these strange derivatives. Um, that resulted in this reduction in our overall power costs. Well, originally, I think some of the board members are here. Uh, we're but we're not to talking it. to the board members. Huh? But we're not talking to the board members. I'm talking to you, but then maybe they can answer. <laughs> I think originally they were going to set it at a uh, not to exceed 50 or 53 million dollars. Uh, and then somehow it started going further than that. There, Are they going to return that money no back to the, there to the rate There has been payers? no additional money put in other than what the board allocated uh, about a year ago. So about a year ago when the books closed, when we knew what our financial results for 2009 were, <clears throat> the board decided to restrict some of the cash that was available uh, to the district. So it took it out of the general fund and then put it in a Reserve rate stabilization account. account that only the board has access to. That money has stayed there. It's grown by interest, but even for $53 million, interest today is not particularly uh, large. So it stayed there for a year. We have now closed the 2010 uh, books. We know what our uh, operating results were for 2010. That money will also go, or a portion of that uh, will go into the rate stabilization account. <clears throat> now, the way in which it's being proposed, I don't know that the board is going to accept it, but the way it's being proposed is that you now have a rate stabilization account such that, on average, the residential rate's about 12.85 cents. Say the rate suddenly jumps up to 13 and a half because um, something bad happens. Rate jumps up. The rate to the customer would stay the same, but the other uh, short revenue shortfall that the uh, district has would come out of the rate stabilization account. So the customer will pay the same rate regardless of what happens. If the 
rate goes down, then any surplus would go into the rate stabilization account. If the rate goes up, then any money would be drawn from the rate stabilization account. Wait a minute. You say if the rate goes below, that but for simplicity, think. let's say that the rate stabilization account is uh, that the ECA is five cents and the base uh -huh. rate is five cents. Yeah. Okay, just for simplicity. Yeah. Now all of a sudden the rate goes up from five. The ECA mm. goes up from five to six cents. The customer would still pay five cents, mm -hmm. but that one cent differential would be drawn out of the rate stabilization account. But the next month, the rate goes down to four cents. Mm -hmm. Now the, the utility is over collecting. The over collection would go back into the rate stabilization account. Yeah. Well, then in that case, the rate isn't floating at all. It stays the same. No, the rate will float. <laughs> what will ultimately end up happening is three, four years from now, and I believe. Okay. And I'm not the finance uh, CFO. Correct me. Four years from now, the rate stabilization account will be zero. Okay. If that happens and the rate goes up to six cents, then the customer will pay more. If the rate goes down, then the customer will see a break. Well, if it goes down below four cents, uh, five cents, oh. does the customer pay less? The customer would pay less at that point. I thought you said it was people's, the excess will be... Currently, until the rate stabilization account goes to zero. Yeah. Okay, so the customer can either pay less, and depends on how the uh, board decides to do this. If it goes down to nine cents, the, customer, the board may decide But you're kind to of con contradicting there. If it's I five do. cents, let's say that it's still at five cents, and if it goes down to four, how can we pay less if the difference goes back up to the stabilization rate? Because we, we know cents. three years from now, rates are going to go up. Okay? We know that. We already know through our financial projections that you're looking at about a 7% rate increase in 2013. Okay? So the board can make a decision that it either reduces your rates now and charges more three or four years from now, or the board can make the decision to stabilize your rates as long as we have excess monies coming in. What's the board, uh, what does the board ultimately do? I do not know. The board members would like to address that. That's up to them, or if they'd like to just listen to me rattle on and say the board will decide, <laughs> that's what I would suggest they do. Well, Mr. Koch, for, uh, if they will be taking this up on April 12th for our next meeting, can we have uh, an item on our agenda where there's an update for the ECAC members as to uh, how the board did uh, proceed with this item. What, what they will take up on the 12th is a recommendation to set rates. So they will see this and vote, hopefully vote, on whether or not to set a rate hearing, on whether or not to adopt a floating ECA and how to implement it. I don't know when that uh, date is. I, and I don't see anybody here who does. But right. I would be more than happy to have somebody from the finance department <laughs> who has prepared the presentation and the recommendation come before you and tell you if they know the direction of the board. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. And that's just, again, because there, it seems that there are some questions from the board or the committee members. So if you could please include that in the, in the agenda, Marion, for uh, next meeting. Thank you. Any other questions or any other updates from you, Mr. Koch? No, sir. Thank you. At this time, then, uh, we will begin to my left with uh, any of the member comments. <laughs> uh, are you talking down to Chris? No, I'm sorry, my left. Uh, immediately. First? Yes. Oh, okay, me first. Great presentations and pretty short. I'm pretty amazed. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to say that I was able to attend the Energy Summit last month. It was a good, uh, good pre presentation by the people that attended. Uh, myself, uh, like I have a, I have a business in Calipatria, so I make some contact with some of the people that are going to build some uh, solar plants in the area. So, I, uh, in itself, Calipatria has got like three, three or four. Uh, site they're planning to build solar, solar plants, so I hope that they, they will come through. No comment at this 
A good presentation. I appreciate the information. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Get out. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, I would just like to say that I was really, uh, Tom, I appreciated your, your uh, uh, report because I was very concerned about the health and safety issue because it was brought up in La Quinta. Uh, some people came about the radiation and how it affected the, um, what do you call it, the pacemaker. Uh, pacemaker. So that was a concern. So I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you very much. None at this time. Thank you. Uh, ditto the very good presentation. I compliment staff. <laughs> no comment. Uh, I'd like to comment on the fact that I was at uh, Sun City Palm Desert where the Energy Department did a great presentation for the Energy Conservation Fair they had. And I actually learned something there which is <laughs> from, e from IID, I mean. I have one more comment. Thank you. Uh, in regards to this ECA, uh, I, I feel grateful that somebody is trying to help us to cope with the 2013 price hike and by considering this, uh, this account. Um, whether it's sustainable or not is another question, but I'm grateful somebody's trying to think of how to make it easier on the consumer. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Bayard, uh, that we can actually teach lots of people a lot about conservation. And as much as you hear about solar and solar uh, activities at your home, I keep trying to stress, you are better off taking money and putting it into home conservation. It will lower your overall cost more than if you put a solar PV facility on your house. Mm -hmm. Conservation pays. Okay. Now go out and get a solar and conservation. <laughs> uh, really? Thank you. Uh, my only comment is uh, thank you, uh, committee members, for bearing with me. This was my first my first meeting. Um, so at this time, uh, we will have our next meeting uh, May 2nd at the La Quinta office. Um, Move for any, We're not going to have the... Oh. No. What do you call it? Oh, we'll know. Uh, we will... But, uh, Conference. If it's ready, then uh, Marion will inform Sta you. Staff, myself, will rotate back and forth regardless. So I will always move, and the, pres the pre uh, presenters will always move back and forth from one to the other. Okay. So while the board members can stay here, we're there. Staff will be up on May 2nd in La Quinta. And then June the question here. question is, are we going to have that thing working right so that we Definitely don't have no. to go over there and then have to come over? She, that's what she's hoping, but we don't right. know for sure. Oh, we don't know for sure. But staff will be at La Quinta. If it is, I'm assuming it's working, that everything's fine. Staff will go back and forth so that the, all board members have a chance to interact with us personally, rather than my preference would be just to stay right here. <laughs> We did have a motion uh, by committee member Bayard. Do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Franklin. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned at 7.15 p.m. Aye.